good day to everyone listening in the TKW community. We have got a really good one for you today. Today, we are going to talk about testing, certification, verification. What is it? Why you should be doing it? Why you need to be doing it? And what the differences are between. We've got two really great guests today. Uh, number one, Mike Grindell of Trend. Mike, how are you? Very well, thank you, Ray. How about yourself? Hey, man, I'm living the dream. Thanks for taking time and getting on. And hey, uh, we have me. everybody knows, everybody knows Chuck Bowser. Chuck Bowser, Let's Talk Cabling Podcast, as well as the world's most informed human being on all things cabling. Chuck, how are you, buddy? I don't know about the world's most informed, but I'll take knowledgeable. Okay. I'm great, man. How you doing, Mr. Ray? Uh, you know, man, it's another day in paradise. I get to talk to you guys. Uh, we just kicked off our text giving project. So we've got five of our techs down in Baltimore right now, kind of doing an assessment on the site. So that's super, super, super exciting. Um, but I'm here to talk to you guys about certifications, verification, qualification, testing. So Chuck, you are, you know, the leading expert on this thing in, in our area here. And I know you don't want to hear it, but let, let's start. So I guess, you know, you wrote a great article on LinkedIn and, and I'll put the link down here for anybody that hasn't read it yet. But I want to kind of base this podcast on that article a little bit uh, because it's very informative. It's very direct. It's to the point, short, sweet, the way things should be. Um, let's talk about what testing is and why you should be doing it in the first place. So I heard somebody use the term once. Testing is like giving a birth certificate. Right. And I never really thought about that before. And 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 it, it is true. I mean, you're 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 giving a, a birth certificate for that cable that you just installed. You know, as you mentioned, there are there are technically you mentioned the article in the article. I only talked about two types of tests or certification and verification. But there's technically three certification, qualification and verification. And you got to choose the right tool for the job. The thing is, with with the, with getting a birth certificate, you, what you're doing is you're verifying that the cable you just installed, dropped down the wall, terminated and punched down and screwed the faceplate in the wall, that it's going to work. It's going to work. Now, like anybody else, do you want to have a, a you know, you can say, hey, I was born on such and such date, but is there a document to prove that? So that's where that's where the the rub comes into play, and also budget, because there's a huge price difference from a verifier to a certifier, <laughs> huge difference, huge difference. And I, my, I'm of the opinion that whenever possible, you should always certify every cable, every single cable. Now, we can have a conversation about whether or not you sell that certification to the customer, but as a professional, if you have the ability, I think you should certify every cable. But because of the cost of certifiers, sometimes that's not every technician's issued a brand new certifier as soon as they get hired on by a company. Just again, going down your article, Chuck, you kind of give us a nice blueprint for this podcast here. What what types of, of cabling would you be testing, verifying, certifying? So in today's environment, the probably the most common are going to be UTP, shielded cabling, and coax. Probably the, the UTP being the most predominant, right? And I don't want to assume that everybody who listens to this show knows exactly what I'm talking about when I, when, I, when I do things. So UTP cable is an unshielded twisted pair cable. Most commonly used one is a four-pair cable. It has eight conductors twisted into four pairs of two. And they're twisted at different rates to reduce the effects of EMI and RFI. Um, unshielded cable is called unshielded because there's no shield inside it because they're using the twist rates to reduce those alien crosstalk issues, internal and external alien crosstalk issues. Um, and that's fine for the majority of the installs that you're going to be doing in the U.S. Then there's the shielded, or some people like to call it screen twisted pair cable. And there's a whole, that could, that's a whole show for itself, the difference between shielded and screen. But So now you got two additional things that you won't find in a UTP cable. In a shielded cable, you have a drain wire and also a foil shield. Sometimes it's an overall foil shield. Sometimes each of the four pairs has a foil shield. Sometimes it has an overall foil shield and each of the four pairs has a foil shield. Those are a pain in the neck to terminate, by the way. I'll just put that, I'll throw that out there. Now, the, the one of the way, oh, I forgot to mention, there is, a, there is an unshielded twisted pair cable that does have a foil shield inside of it. It's called a discontinuous isolation wrap. It's not continuous from one end to the other. 
the way you can tell the difference between the two is that discontinuous unshielded twisted pair cable does not have a drain wire. That's how you know it's a UTP cable. There's no drain wire in it. And then the other cable that we test from time to time, I got a moth flying around in my thing in here. Uh, and then the other one is coax cabling. Some people say, Chuck, we're not doing coax anymore. Yes, we are. We're, there's still a lot of people out there doing coax. It's not a big segment of the industry, but there's still people out there doing it. Just, just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not happening. So you need a tester that's going to be able to test all three of those components, even if you never think you're going to test coax cable, because some point somebody's going to say, hey, we've got this video feed that we need you to check this coax cable for. You know, I'm, 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 my dad always used to say, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Chuck, the, uh, the other thing that, you know, again, your article is based on copper. So I do want to talk to you a little bit about fiber. So I'm assuming fiber comes into play with testing verification certification as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely it does. Uh, so with fiber, you typically have two common types of tests, tier one testing and tier two testing. There's some confusion about that, too. And that's actually a good, uh, might be a good article to write maybe the next next week's article. on. I try to do an article a week now. I've made a commitment to trying to do one one article a week on my Let's Talk Cabling. Uh, if you go to LinkedIn, there's a group called Let's Talk Cabling. So that's where I'm putting those articles if you want to read them. So tier one testing using a power law, an optical loss test set, which consists of a power meter and a, and a loss set. What you're doing is you're measuring the actual loss. Now the advantages there is with a tier one test, you are getting accurate, very accurate readings. And tier one testers are generally cheaper than tier two testers. Tier one testers are super easy to use. You literally turn them on. You wait for the light source to stabilize. You zero out the meter and then you, you're off and running, right? And it's either a pass or a fail. It either works or it doesn't work. The issue with tier one testers is it only tells you what your overall loss is. It doesn't tell you where that loss is coming from. So for example, let's say that you and I, Ray, we're, we ran a fiber optic cable somewhere in downtown Philadelphia and you terminate one side, I terminated the other. I put my tier one tester on it and I shoot it. And let's say my budget that I'm looking for is 1.5. The optical loss test is going to come back and say it's 1.7. Well, that's a fail because it's over the budget. Why do, why do so many people have problems with fiber optic budgets? Think of it as a checking account. If you deposit $100 in your checking account, what happens if you try to spend $105 at the store? Right? Either a bounce check fee or you get super embarrassed with a bunch of people behind you. Fiber optic loss budget is the exact same thing but you're talking about signal strength instead of money. So if you exceed your budget, it's a fail. So now we have a fail. Well, I'm going to assume, Ray, it's your connectors. I don't make mistakes, period. So I'm going to go to your side. I'm going to cut it off. I'm going to re-terminate it, and I'm going to shoot it again. And guess what? I'm still getting that 1.7 because you know what? It was my side because I had a triple latte, cappuccino, whatever, whatever you drink from Starbucks, and I had, and, and I had a bit of the shakes going on. That's the problem with a tier one tester. You just have too much loss. You don't know where it's coming from. Enter the tier two tester, the OTDR, optical time domain reflectometer. A lot of people think, oh, that, that's the best tester it is out there. It is the best for troubleshooting, not the best for certifying. <laughs> because the, the OTDR, it shoots a light down that fiber and based on which you some parameters you said in the tester, as that light goes down, some of the some of the light gets reflected back. So it does measure loss, but it's a calculation, not the actual loss. Now, granted, it's a it's a pretty close calculation, but it's still a calculation. Where tier two testers really come into the light is when it comes time to troubleshoot. So if I put a no TDR on the cable that you and I ran, I could quickly identify that it was my connector that was messed up, not yours. And I can cut off the right connector and only replace one connector instead of replacing both. That's where two, two testers come, really come into it. Hey, come Chuck, light and, and I may light. Yeah. add to that, uh, also in a tier two tester, OTDR, you can have several splices along the way, right? And a, an OTDR is going to identify every single event in that cable, uh, that fiber, and it's going to give you the loss of each one. So in an OTDR, in the example we've talked about, you could have a you know, a couple of a splice that is actually over the limit, but the overall length, you have some headroom there. So the overall length passes because your DB loss is good. So, you know, there is definitely a place for tier one and tier two.
from a cable manufacturer uh, certifier perspective, we sell a lot of tier ones with our copper testers. So that's the most common. Tier two is used primarily for troubleshooting, but sometimes the, the Googles, the Metas, the, you know, the financial institutions want tier one and tier two on their fiber. So. Yes. And, and the reason those big companies want those, those dual tests like that is because you're, again, the three most important things you can remember being in the communications industry, document, document, document. So with that tier two tester, you're documenting, documenting, I just made up a word. That's a Toddism right there. BS with Todd. Love you, brother. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're documenting the performance of that cable on a date. So there's, I've done a lot of projects over my career. I was actually, I had to update my resume um, because I'm doing some volunteer work for POE consortium. They needed my a resume. I was like, I don't have a resume. I'm not looking for a job. I haven't been looking for a job in decades, but anyways, I digress. So I had, and I was looking at, and man, I really, I've been on a lot of cool projects. Well, one of the projects I did was, um, a building on the university of Maryland campus. And the building was, uh, was rented by the federal government. And the federal government told the university of Maryland that under no conditions could this building ever, ever lose connectivity, period. Now, I don't know what they did in the building, but I ran the fiber cable to it. And we had to shoot it with the fiber after we got done with it. And we had to shoot it with a tier one and a tier two tester. Mm -hmm. And then every December, we go back to that same building and shoot it with an OTDR again. That's called maintenance testing. And we would compare the pre that test result with the previous test result. And if it even looked like that fiber was going to fail, they'd replace it. Because that building never never lost connectivity ever period <laughs> so so yeah tier two testers definitely have their place now my day job most people know who my day job is i don't broadcast it but my day job is a connectivity manufacturer and if you install our fiber optic products you have to use a tier one tester for the warranty program yeah we don't accept tier two testers because we want that actual loss so to continue that, and, and one, if you and I were on a job together doing fiber and one end or the other was the question, 100% would be my end. I don't do fiber. <laughs> I, uh, I actually bought a fiber splicer and gave it to another member in the community. I'm like, I don't even know why I bought the thing. I don't do enough fiber to justify it. But uh, yeah, so for everybody listening, to be clear, it would have been my end that was broken, not Chuck's. So <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking at a fiber splicer too. I'm trying to talk... Uh, UCL Swift into giving me one so I can go around and do one hour fiber classes as I travel and stuff and, and teach and stuff like that. So I, I, I want to, I want that KF4A, but man, that thing's $5,000. Yeah. Oof. You know, it's, it's crazy. The, the tools are crazy expensive, but they are crazy important in what we do. So I, mm -hmm. I get it. That's the but, but to your point, verifiers are not crazy expensive. Qualifiers are a little bit more expensive, a little more processing power, a lot more processing power. And certifiers have twice as much processing power. Uh, I mean, a certifier can do, for example, 250,000 measurements in you know five, seven seconds. That's a lot of processing power. That's why yeah. it costs as much oh, as yeah. a small car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, exa exactly right. So, you know, a certifier, what it's, for those who may not know, it's measuring the cable's electrical properties, and it's comparing that to what the standards allow, the ISO ANSI standards. If standard, that standards tells us we're allowed to have this much crosstalk, this much attenuation, and it's going to measure those, and it's going to compare it to the standards. And if it meets it, win a win or chicken dinner, rock on, you're good to go. And most connectivity manufacturers require certification testing for warranty applications. And, it like, and, and you, like you said, it is the most expensive. Now, when you go to the verifiers, they're definitely a lot cheaper. They, they can range anywhere from 25 bucks to 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, the verifiers are going to be doing, they're looking for opens, shorts, transposals, reversals, and split pairs, right? So it's a simple, basic continuity tester. Some of the more complex verifiers, you know, if you start getting up into the two, three, four, five hundred dollar range, some of those actually have some TDR functionality to it, which will actually tell you what the length is, right? I've got I've got a verifier sitting in my cabinet behind me. I, I bought it off of Amazon for, for 25 bucks. And there are times where that's going to be the right tester to use, right? So, you know, if you're on a job site, you're, you're showing up at a job site to pull cable and it's a law firm and you tell the crew, unload the truck, I'm going to go up and make contact with the, uh, with the customer. And you go up and you meet your point of contact and, and they say, hey, look, we have a, we have a new uh, senior partner. 
their cable's not working. Well, was it working yesterday? Yes, it was. Well, I have my backpack on me. In my backpack, I have my verifier. Do you think I'm going to go all the way back down to the loading dock to get my certifier for that? No, because it's probably a continuity issue. Yeah. I'm going to take it out and pop it on. There are times where, you know, again, manufacturer warranties. Certifier is the only way to go, right? And because of the cost of certifiers, they range from, you know, eight nine thousand dollars up to twenty three twenty four twenty five thousand dollars if you go with the the expensive one with all the bells and whistles mm-hmm. um companies just can't afford to give every employee a brand new certified it, it just it's just not going to be realistic and so you have to manage that the certifiers within the company you have to have sign out processes know where it is know when the last time it was calibrated by the way they do have to be calibrated yearly per the standards and they got to be calibrated. As a matter of fact, when you turn on the calibration, I just got mine calibrated just two weeks ago. When you turn them on, when you get close to that calibration date, it pops up and says, ding, hey, I need to be calibrated. And you have to exit past that screen. So don't ever try to tell somebody, well, I didn't know it needed to be calibrated. Yes, you did. <laughs> you, didn't read the, you didn't read the menu. You just escape, 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 escape. So sorry, I didn't mean to, yep. didn't mean to rule that. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's all important information. But let's actually talk about that, right? So what is the difference between a verifier, a certifier? What is the use case? Or can we label them all as testers, right? They're all testers, right? A certifier is no, a tester. Technically, yep. yeah. Oh, so, I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it depends on what you're doing. If you're trying to certify the cable for a warranty, then the certifier is going to be the, the thing. That's the same if, let's say, for from example, our perspective, by the way. When people ask us, you know, manufacturers, which one do we need? Do you need warranty? Need a certifier? Okay, go ahead. I want to see how. Yeah, how yeah, yeah, mine. exactly. And then, but there's other times too where the certifier is not the right tool for the job. Let's say, for example, I, you know me, Ray. I got a farm, right? So I got a go pen. Yeah, about 400 feet down that way, right? And uh, we're getting ready to go into breeding season. So we're gonna pick up us a, a, a male goat, put it down there, and have some baby goats. Oh, I love baby goats, by the way. They're so much cute. <laughs> Well, my wife likes to monitor them during the birthing process. So she wants me to run a camera down there. Well, guess what? It's 400 feet. That's not going to run on a, on, a, on a permanent length because the maximum length is 295. But, you know, there's this cable called Game Changer yep. that can do those extended distances, right? So Certifier is going to give you a fail because it's, it's gone past the 328 feet. That's the channel length. You have the permanent link length and channel length. Um, permanent link is the measurement from the connector on the faceplate to the port on the patch mount. It's called permanent because theoretically, once it's installed, terminated, and tested, nobody should be taking it off and replacing it. You can if you're an installer, but the customer shouldn't be doing that. The, the channel is going to include the permanent link plus those patch cords. That's where, that's where the difference in the measurements are, right? So now that I got the cable down there, it's 400 feet. My, hit my certifier is going to be wrong. I don't care. I'm not applying for a manufacturer warranty. It's a go pen, right? So I can take a qualifier and I can put a qualifier on it. And as Mike said, qualifiers are cheaper. I don't have one, but they are cheaper. And I can put data back and forth on that. And if it can pass that data successfully, it's going to come back and say, yes, it works. It doesn't care about the length of the cable. It just says, we, we send data back. We can send, transmit and receive it back and forth without any drop packets. So let me- that's, that's the difference between a verifier and a certifier. And there are, there are uses for each. Jumping in on that one. So that's exactly right. So a qualifier, uh, you know, some are double-ended, some are single-ended, but a double-ended one actually sends data back and forth. Can I run another 20 cameras on this network at this resolution at this codec? Can I simulate uh, 100 voice over IP calls simultaneously? Is my network going to handle it or is it going to puke? If it pukes, where? So I don't care about TIA or ISO standards. I'm not suing anything for warranty. Use more by end users per se, like in you know Chuck's case, that is an end user. And my wife wants a camera on the goat pen, right? Um, so I just want to make sure I can get data from point A to point B, and it's going to work. I don't care how much near and cross talk headroom I have at all. Does the data pass bi-directional? Yep. Yep. And and that's important for people to know. Does a certifier do that, Mike and Chuck? Does a certifier Does it- give you that qualification, so to speak, that it can handle that type of traffic? No, it's making assumptions. So a certifier is saying that 
here's the cable's actual performance. Here's how the standard says it perform. So it passes the standards. Now the standard says, look, if your if your cable run meets this criteria, then we know that this cable will support these types of networks 99% of the time. That's why we that's that's why you get, I hate getting these conversations with people. Oh well, you know, um, you can do 10 gig over Cat 5e. Yeah, you can. Short distances. That's where that 295 comes from, right? The 295 comes from says you got to use Cat 6a because we're trying to get to that 295 because that's going to cover the vast majority of jobs out there. And a lot of people don't know where that 295 number comes from. A lot of people will tell you, well, that's the average run length of a cable back in the 90s when they wrote the standards. <laughs> no, it's not. And I know that because I was pulling cable back in the 90s. And I'm also good at math. In order to your average to be 295, that meant you were pulling 600-foot runs. A lot of them. We weren't pulling 600-foot runs. The 295 comes from... I just happen to have a piece of cable on my desk. I'm not sure. You, I guess you'd expect that from a show called Let's Talk Cabling. I got cable sitting on my desk. Right? <laughs> so what happens is, and you've heard this, Ray, because you actually, uh, you, you've heard this before. So when you're typing on a computer, you're creating ones and zeros, right? So the computer takes those ones and zeros. The transmitter puts it into a packet. It puts a start bit on it. It puts a stop bit on it. And then it transmits that signal down the cable. When the receiver gets that packet, by the way, that's called an asynchronous transmission. So when the receiver gets that, it takes off the start bit, takes off the stop bit. It's left with the ones and the zeros. It sends them ones and the zeros to the computer. And then the receiver, this is what most people miss. The receiver sends a signal back to the transmitter. Hey, I got it. Send the next one. Well, when the transmitter, the, when the transmitter receives that signal, it says, okay, and it sends the next packet. So the transmitter, it only listens for... 550, 570 nanoseconds, depending on what frequency you're measuring it at. If it doesn't get that confirmation within that time frame, the transmitter assumes that packet was lost and it resends the packet. So that's why we're based on 295. And, but that, that was based on category three cable and 10 base T ethernet, 10 megabit ethernet, not 10 gigabit, megabit ethernet. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm like, yeah, but Chuck, we're doing 5E, we're doing 6, we're doing 6A. We should be able to go beyond those distances. No, because the more bandwidth you try to shove down a cable, the shorter that run has to be unless you change the physical properties of the cable. That's why Cat 6A has tighter twist rates. That's why Cat 6A is 23 gauge. That's why they play around with the, the dielectric around the conductor to get, that, to, get to get that performance to that 295. So that's the benchmark that the injury has been stuck on for, oh, I don't know, decades. So let me um, throw another thing in there. So I learned this from um, one of our developers, Dan Barrera, you know, trying to explain the difference between certification and qualification. He says, think about a racetrack, right? So you, you're going to build a racetrack for cars. And if you build it out of this material and you build, get your pitch rate on the, on the curves at this rate, and you do all these things to all these specifications that should run race cars at over 200 miles an hour. You know, they, they should not, they should be able to handle that. Right? So I did this. Oh, and by the way, in the morning when there's dew on the, on the asphalt, you know, you take a measurement, then you take a measurement five minutes later than the heat of the day. So you think about six, a goes to 500 megahertz. We test one megahertz or actually 0 0.255, 0 0.751, 1.25, all the way up to 500. We're measuring those times a day as the sun comes out and has different effects, right? So, but if you pass all these standards, you should be able to run a race car at 200 miles an hour. A qualifier gets a guy in a race car and gets him around the track. You know, I don't care about all the measurements, you know, does the car stay on it, right? So he qualified it. So certified says, yeah, if you do all these, no problem, that should work. A race car driver says, yeah, and I got actually 220 miles an hour on that thing. So, so no, and, and Mike, that is a phenomenal example. And that, that actually, when I talk to my customers and I talk to even people in the community, I like to compare them to things that people know. So whenever I talk about DHCP and people don't know what DHCP is, I say, it's your home address, right? So when you tell somebody where your home is, your home to the post office is a number, right? Nobody knows what the hell a number means, but you can say, go to my house and people know what that means. So that is a good way to describe what DHCP really is, right? Yeah. 
or I'm sorry, what DNS is. I'm describing completely different things. That's DNS. Yeah. Not DHCP, folks. I was going to say, you had me confused there for yeah, a second. Well, well, well. Main name service, the dynamic host control protocol. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, DHCP so is uh, something different. Forget everything I said, but that's, what I, that's how I describe mm-hmm. DNS to people. It's you never tell people what your physical address is. You tell people this is my home. So that, that's an easy way to go about it. When you compare things to things that people understand and you're actually using the words properly, it's, it's a much easier way to do it. Your, your analogy to a racetrack is perfect. And then, um, you know, so it should be able to support 200 miles an hour. And, and truck to your point, oh, I've got, I can run further on mine. Yeah, the race car can go 220 miles an hour, right? He pushed it. Great. Congratulations. You know, so that, that's what it qualifies to. The standard says you do all this right, and this is what you should be able to run on it. So l- let's, let's actually detail this now. So we've given examples. What is a qualifier? What is a certifier? And what is a, I, I don't want to use the word verifier. tester or verifier. Yeah. So how about what? In, in that same example, how about the stopwatch? I just made that up. You know, it's a real cheap, real expensive. He tapped, you know, stop watching his laps. Verifier. He's not, didn't care about anything that he's just measuring. Do, you know, did he get from point A to point B back around there? Continuity, if you will. You know, so very simple, not nearly as detailed. I'm not sending packets. I'm not, I'm not measuring, you know, 5,000 or 250,000 measurements. I'm saying, you know, do do I have continuity? Is this wire? connected on both ends your verifiers then so we're clear is your continuity testers your lowest end point a to point b doesn't care the distance it just cares i have x amount of wires on one end i've got x amount of wires on the other end and they match yeah and they're paired up right perfect or not and as chuck said some of the more expensive ones can say it's not and by the way Pin sevens broke at, you know, 72 feet from where you're standing. Exactly. You know, so you get that. That's why they range from 25 to 600 bucks. Yeah. The 600 buck ones will tell you, oh, the length of the conductors and stuff like that. The 25 buck one, it's just going to give you a little green light. Ding. Yep. Or a little red light. Ding. Problem. <laughs> yeah. It's not exactly. even, it's not, yeah, it's not even a different ding. It's the same ding, just a different color. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you got an expensive one. That don't, actually- don't plug it into a live circuit because you'll burn out that LED. Yep. Don't ask me how I know that. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So now we've got that. What is the next step up? Let's talk about those. So the next from- step up from the stopwatch, which we just talked about. So ah. we have the stopwatch, which okay. is our verifier. What is our next step up from the stopwatch verifier? So I'll take a stab at it. So as Chuck said, some, someone just uh, is, is pin one connected to pin one. That's your basic. Now, a little step up is, okay, if it's not, where's, the, uh, where's it broken? We throw in a TDR functionality, time domain reflectometry. We know the electronic signals, how fast, it, you know, in the example Chuck gave earlier, based on we do some fancy math and say that's seven feet out. Um, then some of them do things like um, POE. There's a little bit of crossover, right? So on that same cable, I'm running it. I want to check my pin out. And by the way, I detected PoE. Okay. If it's class four, it should give me, you know, this, this many watts, this many volts. If it's class eight, it should give me more. So they kind of go into a a little bit of a crossover from there. Um, And let's go even down to further basic verifiers. Let's talk about a tone and probe. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the most basic yeah, verifier. A lot of people don't know you can do continuity with a toner and probe. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, you absolutely can. Simple. And it saved me in millions of jams. Yeah. So I would go tone and probe is the most basic and then the pin outs where you can actually see them on a screen or something like that. Then distance and then adding qualification things such as POE is a pretty common one. Okay. Well, if we use, if we use entry level, you can pick up a multimeter for 10 bucks. Yeah, good point. And that's, that's be, that'd be even simpler than a toner. And that actually gives a little bit more information than a toner, too. A toner, you get the simple ding, and light are not good or bad, right? Because um, toners toners can be kind of pricey. You especially start getting the ones that begin with the letter F. Um, some of them toner probes can get kind of expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go to Home Depot or, or Dollar General and buy a volt ohm meter for 10 bucks and test continuity, resistance, and a bunch of other stuff. You just got to know how to use it. That's that's old school stuff right there. Old school. Yeah, but I will say, you know, again, we're, we're trying to keep this very vendor agnostic, but having a tone and probe that can do digital versus analog is huge for us yeah. because you're toning wire that is on an active network. You can't do that with an analog toner. You need the digital one. 
So that is, that's an important tool, but we're not talking about tone and probes. That is a tool that we can use to do some basic verification of a wire. Okay. Um, but the purpose of this talk, again, is I want to kind of try to stay on topic here, is we've got our verifiers, right? Which is low end stopwatch. Great tool. We need it. And there are multiple types of verifiers. The next step up, what do we call them? That would be the qualifier. So we've got a qualifier. So it, goes, it goes verifier, qualifier, certifier. Yep. Perfect. So let's talk about what the verifier can do that a qualifier cannot. I would say they each build on top of each other, generally speaking. So okay. a, a qualifier, generally speaking, is going to do everything a verifier can do. A certifier doesn't necessarily do everything a qualifier can do because, again, a qualifier sometimes is dealing with data. It's actually on the network where a certifier is dark. It, you know, it's just looking at cable end to end, right? So, but a verifier, a qualifier can pretty much do everything a verifier can do, and a certifier can do pretty much everything a, a verifier can do. Do you agree, Chuck? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then you're going to need to make sure that your technician has the skill sets for each one of those, because as the tester becomes more complex, so do the skill sets required to read and interpret those skill sets, right? When you test with that, uh, that toner and probe or that volt ohmmeter, you're not measuring near and crosstalk. You're not measuring any kind of alien crosstalk. And, but when you measure the crosstalk, you need to know what are the possible causes for crosstalk? What's the possible causes for insertion loss? Because this, insertion loss is caused by more than just a cable that's too long. You know, it could be a cable that's wet. It could be a cable that's in a hot environment. That's, when I say hot environment, I mean beyond the temperature range that that cable's made to, to endure, right? There's lots of things it causes. You can even get insertion loss if you use a mismatch of components. If you use Cat 5 E cable and a Cat 6 patch cord, you can get insertion loss yeah. to a point of failure. So that's that's a big topic too, and I, I want to jump back to that very at the end of this because that that's a real important topic too, and that's kind of like a bonus content for the end of this podcast. Um, but I do want to get back to um, what would you consider – a verification tool then again what what type of tool is a verification tool i mean we want to stay vendor agnostic here i mean but a lot of a lot of uh we'll call them you know video data and voice you know vdvs type testers right so i can do rj11 for for my you know telephone i can do rj45 for my network i can do coax and again it's just those types of testers I mean, again, they come in all shapes and sizes, like uh, Chuck said, $25 up to 600 roughly. And, um, but yeah, we, I mean, it, trend, we call them our VDV line of testers and teletones, uh, visual fault finders. If you're talking about fiber, you know, that type of stuff, but you know, all those are verification type tools. Um, and it's not only trend, there's others out there that make, you know, but they're generally, they're, there's something about video data and voice There's something like that in the somewhere in the title or on the box somewhere. Chuck, okay. anything to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would grab the tool for the job, right? So if I'm just a service tech who's fixing something, probably we're using a verifier, right? If I'm an I'm a installation crew and we just got done putting in 250 cables, I'm going to want a certifier. If I've got a unique situation where I got a farmer putting a camera in a goat barn, you know, 400 feet away from their house, then I'm probably going to need to use my qualifier for that because that's the tool for that job. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think they're, they're all great examples. And that's why I keep asking these questions kind of over and over in different ways, because there, if you look online and you read a lot of forums and you go into different communities, there is a different answer for everyone, but you guys keep coming back to the same points and the same right. things over and over again in different ways. Right. And that's why I asked the questions the way that I did. So I really appreciate you guys, taking the time to kind of explain different scenarios and use case scenarios for each thing. Um, I guess, Mike, this question is for you. Sure. Um, let's just, let's start with this. Let's say I don't have a qualifier verifier uh, certifier on site. We know that when we plug in a wire, it doesn't work. What do you think the first thing a technician should look for? Continuity this, verifier, you know, do, do I have my pinouts correct? Uh, okay. Chances are, I mean, you know, when we were at the uh, at Tech Fest, ran a scenario, right? And we, we, we couldn't get it to pass certification. Why wasn't it passing certification? Continuity. You know, there's a little piece of plastic in one of the pins and we had to 
flipped that out and we had continuity. Now we could actually go ahead and do the other, you know, 249,999 measurements, right? So, but it's continuity is 80% of the issues typically. Right. And this is where most, most technicians fail. You know, they, they go from being the driver on the side of the, in the pit stop to being the driver crossing the, the finish line. There's a lot of in-between there, a lot of in-between. When you're testing, the very first thing you should do before you even touch a tester is a visual inspection, right? A visual inspection. Make sure that the, you know, that, you know, especially if you're having an issue with the cable, I'd pull it off and make sure it looked like it was terminated right because you'd be surprised how much you can find just doing a visual inspection. You know, when you look at the IDC connector, one of the conductors is not seated all the way down. It's only when they punch it down, it only went down halfway. Well, you're getting an intermittent continuity issue, right? So the visual inspection should be the very first step that you do when you're doing any kind of troubleshooting. And in that example, that can change with heat as well. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, hey, I, I have continuity, and sometimes during the day it just randomly goes down. No, it's not random at all. It's when the heat gets above a certain temperature, you know, that loses that, you know, that, that condenses, whatever. So you got issues like that. Uh, Ray, you mentioned fiber earlier. I mean, you know what the number one cause of fiber failure is? I think we all know this. Dirt. <laughs> Contaminated end faces, right? You could have a, the, I don't have any hair. Like, Ray, you're the only one that has hair on this call. Good for you. <laughs> nice. Head. I, oh. I have far too impressive. much hair. That is impressive. But That is why I wear a hat. <laughs> <laughs> A single strand of hair is going to wreak havoc on your fiber. It's going to block that light in, in some cases, right? And something as thin as that, you know, and just all the dirt particles flying in the air. Oh, I'm good. I put my dust caps on. <laughs> That's where you put it. It was clean. You had dust in your dust cap. You put it on there. Now you contaminate it again. So continuity is your number one source of failures, copper or fiber. It doesn't matter. Yeah, the average human hair, I think, is about 15 to 20 microns. A piece of contamination as small as three micron can wreak havoc on your end face, depending on which zone it falls in. When you look at an end face on a fiber optic cable, there's multiple zones. Zone A is the core. Okay, that's where the light's coming down. Zone B is the cladding, zone C is the ferrule, and then there's a couple of the zones outside of that. If you've got contamination on the core, zone A, that's a huge bigger impact than contamination in zone three, right? Or zone C, depending on which literature you read. So, and, and a lot of people don't realize this, and here's why contamination is such a problem. If you, if you have a piece of dirt on, the, on your end face of your fiber, when you mate those two fibers together, there's 2.2 pounds of pressure holding those two fiber optic end faces together. 2.2 pounds doesn't sound like a bunch until you divide that out by the surface area that's actually touching. Now you're talking about 40,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. So if you have a piece of dirt on that end face and you mate them together with that kind of pressure, Depending on what that contamination is made out of, you could actually cause that contamination to blow up into multiple pieces of contamination. You could even cause the contamination to be embedded into the glass. Glass is not, technically not a solid, it's an anamorphous liquid. So you can actually cause the debris to get embedded into the glass, and you are not cleaning that out. Mm. You're cutting that connector off and re-terminating it. No, it's yep. very fair. and. And you can look at all this with a, you know, you hook up a fiber microscope to view this at, you know, 200 plus magnification and, you know, all the other fun stuff. But, uh, yeah, a, a pitted, you know, in face is trash. <laughs> yeah. Throw it away. Perfect. Okay. So I think we, we have a, a good understanding of low end to high end on, on what we're using. Now let's talk a couple use case scenarios for what should we be using to troubleshoot networks? Where do you go to? Do we start with a fiber? I'm sorry, with a certifier? Or do we start with maybe a qualifier or a verifier? Where do you start with your troubleshooting your network? I would say it depends on the problem. Like I said, in the right. example you gave earlier, you know, the senior partner's coming in, it worked yesterday, it doesn't work today. I'm going to start with a verifier. However, if you're having, you know, OSI stack layers one through eight, whatever, I, you know, and whatever you add through the user error phase, right? But, you know, now you need some tools, some qualifiers, you plug them into a port and it says, hey, nothing here, it's dead. Or it says, oh, hey, I just plugged in while I'm on here, I noticed it's active. So I went ahead and grabbed a, you know, a, a user DHCP, user DNS, and, you know, got me an IP address. 
Uh, I went ahead and pinged, you know, something default. Maybe it's Google. Hey, I got up to the internet. Oh, and by the way, here's a little bit of activity, right? So you know, oh, here's a VLAN we're on. So a tool like that, if you're looking for not just connectivity issues, but more of an application type issue, you're going to want to step up a little bit more in price and functionality, skill set and training to get to another level of qualifier that's going to give you now network information. Yeah. That, that's where your communication skills really shine, right? And don't assume just because you work in the communications industry that you know how to communicate, right? Talk to the customer, find out what, what happened before the fault and what's happening after the fault because that helps your troubleshooting skills. There's a, there's a term of troubleshooting called half chunking. And what you do is you break the problem in half and you look in the middle towards one end if there's a problem, then it's obviously then you have to chunk that and you keep going down. It's a quick, efficient way of doing it. But you'll have you might have a problem that might. I tested a cable one time. We, we did a new install for a law firm in DC, and we terminated, tested everything, turned it over to the customer. A week after they moved in, they said, "Oh, this secretary's connect cable is not working." We had the uh, IT guys come out and look at it. They say it's a cable problem. Okay, no problem. So we we go out there. We shoot it with a certifier, working fine and dandy. He said, not us. Must be the, must be the computers. The, the bring the computer guys back out again. Not us. Must be the cable. The customer got fed up. The customer said, okay, on Tuesday at 9, PM, 9 a.m., you and the IT people will be here, and we're going to fix this together. No more finger pointing. So we both show up there, working fine and dandy. No problems. So we're just kind of sitting there talking, and all of a sudden the lady goes, okay, it's not working now. I lost my connectivity. And... When she said that, I realized that I heard her office was right outside of a mechanical room. Yeah. I heard the duct work come on. So I grabbed my ladder. I go in the mechanical room. One of the techs ran the cable through the mechanical room and ran it through the springs on the duct work. So every time it would kick on, the vibration would short it out. Yeah. You had to be there when it happened. And if you didn't ask questions, you could be sitting there troubleshooting that thing for months. Oh, here's a crazy example like that. Um, had a uh, same thing, intermittent, just sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This was a, they were um, on the on the shore, and it wasn't my customer, so, but I started to hold it third hand, and it built into, uh, you know, the rock base. And the network would go up and down sometimes, it's just crazy. Uh, you hooked up a qualifier to it and ran just a long term, like a 72 hour, you know, uptime test. And it's sure enough, it goes up, it goes down, whatever. You can just see it. One of the guys looking at it happened to be a sailor. He said, that looks very similar to our tide, the tide flow. So, Chuck, you probably can understand this more than I, but something when the salt water rose and came in, it was doing something that was causing their network to go down. So they had to go with like a shielded or do, do something back there in the back of it. But that's what it was. When the tide rose, that's when their network went down. How are you going to mm -hmm. find that, right? <laughs> So, yep. yeah, you need to invest in tools to, to find these problems. And again, yeah, but, the, let, let's, but let's not gloss over this. The best tool that you can have for troubleshooting anything is the tool between your ears. That's the best tool you can have. I was going to say that in a different way. Every problem has a perfect tool and there's not one tool. We get asked all the time, hey, I need to uh, I need something that will certify to 10 gig. <laughs> okay, we can run 10 gig on your network or I can, you know, certify the CAT standards that said you should, you know, so we have to go through that a lot. But, you know, like the reason for this podcast, most, a lot of people, you know, if it's your job to make tools or to install them, you know, you should understand this. But, you know, most people certified to 10 gig is a very perfectly good thing to ask for. So there's a lot of people in the low voltage industry don't know, don't know the difference between certifiers, verifiers, and qualifiers. The difference between megahertz and megabits. Oh, yeah. Yeah, certifiers yeah. are megahertz, qualifiers are megabits to some degree. Yep. <laughs> That's actually yep. a really good statement. Mike, say that one more time. Certifiers go to megahertz. Cat 5E is what, 100, Cat 6 is 250, Cat 6A is 500 megahertz, and you have to test all those megahertz. Great, don't care at all about megabits, there's not a network. Qualifiers, I want to know about, you know, 10 meg or, you know, not hopefully not 10 meg, 100 meg, 1 gig, 10 meg, you know, or 10 gig. Those are megabits. Qualifiers do megabits. Yeah. Yeah. So the easy way to think about that is 
A certifier is measuring the highway. A qualifier is measuring the traffic on that highway. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yet another great analogy. We got a million yeah. of them. <laughs> I know, and 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 honestly, it's it's conversations like these that are helping shape and and lift an industry that doesn't understand all these technical specifications. So having you both on is key. And I'm going to cut out little snippets of this conversation and post them. But like the last two things you guys says, you know, the megahertz, megabits and the highway versus the, you know, the speed and traffic, that is incredible analogies that people can understand. Kudos to you Mm -hmm. guys. I, you know what, we should have just started with that and ended with it. I mean, I don't think we need much else. (laughs) There's the summary. My job here is done. Oh man, that was amazing guys. Thank you. Um, any, any, any last minute thoughts that you guys have for that right now in regards to those, before I ask you a couple of little quick questions, I would say, don't go buy a certifier just because you think, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a huge investment, right? Talk to somebody who knows, use this forum, use this community, you know, Hey guys, here's the task I'm looking to do. Here's the problem I have. Can you guys recommend me some tools? You know, and we need to recommend the right tool for the right job. Uh, at the at the lowest possible cost to get the job done as efficiently as possible. That's that's what we're all made that decision to buy. When you made that decision to buy certifier qualifier, before you go lay out six grand, ten grand, twenty five grand, go to a company like Rentelco and rent one of them mm-hmm. and play with it for a month. And that way you'll learn the new ones. It's a lot better doing it that way than going out dumping a chunk of change to find out that's that wasn't quite what you wanted or wasn't what you were led to believe. It's easier to recoup from a thousand dollar, twelve hundred dollar rental than it is a twenty six thousand dollar tester. Demand training too. As you go up in price, hey guys, I'm about to invest you know substantial money in your company. Let's talk about how that train is gonna look. Right? Get your guys trained. And you get a new guy, hey. Company, train them again. I got a new guy. Let's, let's get him. Let's get him trained. Demand training. Yep. I mean, you got these tools that do a lot of cool things. Some of them just do basic certification. Awesome. And you can use them like that. They can also do a whole lot of other things that can save you a ton of operational savings, crunch time, save time. And if you don't know how to use those, you're you have an investment and you're wasting money every time you use it. Oh, yeah. So demand training. And also ask them if they have some type of a loaner program, yep. especially if you're, if you're a company that only has one or two certifiers, but you've got three or four crews. If you lose one of the certifiers, that's a huge impact to your schedule. So, you know, do they have loaning, do they have, do they have some type of a loaning program where you, you, you send yours back to repair, you can get another one. That way it doesn't impact your crew's ability to test and certify. Good point. So all this was incredible. Um, we do, we do have one question because it comes up a lot. Now, this has nothing to do with certification, nothing to do with testing, but it has everything to do with how some installers do work. So <laughs> let's just say this is a for instance because it comes up a lot. Um, I run Cat6 cable throughout a facility. Can I put a Cat5 jack on it and it be acceptable? For Cat5e, yeah. So putting a Cat five E jack on a Cat six wire is acceptable. Is if if you're only expecting Cat five E performance. Okay. Is it can safe I? You're only as good as your weakest link. Yeah, lowest common denominator. Yeah. Okay. I'll so. You, okay. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I give you. I mean, we had a, a, an install where it was failing. It was a certification job. It was failing, and it was failing uh, nearing crosstalk, and. We hooked up a certifier to it and we did some troubleshooting and we said it's failing three feet inside the wall. He's like, that's impossible. It's a home run. It's no, it's impossible. Said this, it's not making it up, right? It's telling you it's three foot inside the wall. Instead of saying it's impossible, let's go take a look. So he pulled the rack out and sure enough, he had cat six install with cat six couplers. <laughs> they, cause they, the fire marshal made them move the rack three foot over. So instead of rerunning all the cables, they put cat six couplers, got three foot patch cords. Then they even taped them thinking they're being really good and stuffed it inside the wall. And of course it failed cat six install cat six couplers failed cat six. They were, you know, cheap connectors or two, three foot, you know, too close to the, I mean, so yeah, it, just because you have a cat six device doesn't mean it's going to fail. And typically you get what you pay for. 
and here's what you're going to run into as well, Ray. A lot of people don't know this. You have to look this up in the standards. Cat 5e is good to 1 gig to 295 feet. Cat 6 is good to 1 gig to 295 feet. So the performance is almost identical anyway. The only place you're really running into a difference is Cat 5e is 100 megahertz. Cat 6 is 250 megahertz. It's not a problem until the customer is expecting the higher level performance. If you put in a Category 6a cable and you put a Cat 5e on it, you're going to get 5e performance, not 6a. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's where the, that's where and it, customers are customers are very cost conscious. Right. You know what I mean by cost conscious? I won't say the word. Yep. And they'll say, "We'll try to save some money. Well, let's put some 5e. Well, okay. But now you're now you're limiting it back to one gig instead of 10 gig. Because it's it's only as good as the weakest point, and it's so necessarily not the. It's usually the patch cords where pe where customers go cheap, right? We'll put in six A cables, six A connectors, and then they'll go buy the cheapest off the shelf offshore patch cord that they can buy that's minimally compliant if it's compliant at all. Yep. And they buy the wrong one. They buy it for five E or six because they didn't catch that little A after the six. Well, again, you're only as good as that weakest link. Agreed. So, final thoughts. Chuck, what are your final thoughts on, on the differences between and, and what is the right tool for the right job? Your brain is the right tool for the right job. <laughs> your brain's the right tool. Because well, you've got to evaluate it first. You know, look at it, look, did, do that visual inspection, ask those questions. From that point, once you gather enough information, then you can make the decision on which tool is going to be the best one for the job. Sometimes the certifier is the right job. Sometimes the verifier is the right job. It just, you got to use the brain first. Mike, same to you. I really can't argue with that. Again, there's so many different scenarios from, you know, from the initial installation on a dark network to troubleshooting a live network with fiber that you have to disconnect to break it, to get into it. So again, it's my job to know it's Chuck's job to know, right? We, we, we know this stuff because we're in this industry and this is our, our livelihood. Most people have it as something they have to, you know, have to use. So you just got to find a trusted advisor. It's like finding that, you know, that mechanic that you finally, it's like, okay, this guy's not going to screw me over. He's going to say, Hey, mm -hmm. that's fine. I was able to fix it with a, you know, $8 piece here. You're good. Versus the other guy is going to say, yeah, it's $800 and more. I'm glad you caught that one. You've got to find your trusted advisor. I don't care if it's your distributor, this forum, your sales guy, but somebody who's out there saying, I am giving you the best advice. I want a customer for life. Um, I'm not going to require you to overspend and, you know, that you don't need to. Here's what you need for that job. Talk to somebody. And the key there that Mike pointed out is trusted advisor. You know, you've got to, don't go to YouTube and watch two men in a Biscayne for your information on how to certify a Category 6 I just showed my age, Biscayne. Does anybody know what a Biscayne is? I have no idea, Chuck. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's a very old Chevrolet. Very ah, old. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> it's what the, the station wagon. Like, when you think of um, uh, the, the, the National Lampoon's Vacation, it's a, it's a station wagon like that. Oh, yep. Gotcha. That's a Biscayne. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so don't go watch that channel. Go to a reputable resource. Go to one of the test manufacturers. Go to somebody who's got the certifications, you know, whether it's, you know, FOA or Bixie Tech Installer, RCD, always evaluate that source of information, you know, before you start. It's always good to listen, but before you start to apply anything that you've heard, evaluate that resource. What's, what's their criteria? What's their certifications? And what's their intent? Because there are some people that'll say, oh, well, you need this because they're, they, they're short on their sales budget that month. So, that's another fact you gotta have to go swirling in the back of your head sometimes. Yeah, but ask questions, and yep. yeah, and, and again, if you're gonna if you're gonna get a tone and probe, you don't need a lot of training on that. If you're gonna get a certifier, guys, let's talk about the training. You know, let's commit to that and get it down before I buy. So the the more money you spend, the more you need to train, because we all do things a little bit different. Some of them do it better than others. And then some of them, <laughs> whatever. Hey, I Mike, tried, I just, tried, right? <laughs> Mike, you just, you just gave birth to a new class. Because I, I did a class on fire stopping that I presented down at, at uh, Tech Fest. It was awesome. And I've been trying to think of another subject for another one-hour class. I think I might do it on testing, copper testing. I, I think you can. I mean, you know, yeah. quite honestly, and, and I'll, I'll say this because Mike is on, and I said we're going to keep it very vendor agnostic, but I love trend. 
Um, you know, I, I've got this beautiful device here. Let me see if I can reach it. Of course, it's tangled. But, uh, <laughs> of course, I've, I've got the land tech over here that I've been doing a lot of videos and, and training on for the guys in our community. And I absolutely love this thing. In, in seven seconds, I can certify a wire. And in seven more seconds, I can upload that to the cloud and have an amazing professional report. Like, quite frankly, I've not seen a better solution than that, period. My opinion. So, it's a question for you. How's it uploaded to the cloud? Is it Bluetoothing to your phone? It's got Wi-Fi built into it. It's a fully Android device with it's this thing. So you got is, connected to a, a Wi-Fi network. A hot in spot. The Usually we hotspot it to our phones, you know, because that's just always in your pocket and always with you, whatever. But yeah, hotspot it. Any Wi-Fi network, just like your phone, it says, oh, here's Wi-Fi networks, which one you want to connect to. Yep. Because that's one of the biggest problems, right? I mean, a technician will have a certifier out in the field and he might be like, two states away and it's a long time for you can get back. And then when he gets back, something happened. They, the test results got deleted or whatever. Now you gotta go back out and retest everything because guess how many times the estimator puts in a project to test a cable. Yep. Just once. once. Yep. So, and, and uh, again, I'm giving trend a lot of credit here cause, cause I love them. Um, and, and I wanted to keep this vendor agnostic, but Mike's here and I'm excited. Um, we literally, so they have team viewer built into this device. So I am able to remote into it with my field technician on site if they have internet. So perfect example, we just did a job in New York city where we certified all of the wiring that we did, but the technician wasn't a hundred percent sure how to use the device. I'm like, get the thing on the wireless that you just installed. I remoted into it and I performed the test, showed him how to do it and was able to get the entire job done by remoting in and doing the work. He literally was my smart hands at that point. Like that is clutch. Plus we ha we kept having a wire fail and I couldn't figure out why. So I sent that information to Mike and his team and they were able to say, you know what, Ray, we know what the problem is. And they were able to recertify that wire without having to replug back into it, which is again, huge. And I don't know that anybody else is doing that. Hey, I'll so, go ahead and say that no. And in that example, Ray could be, you know, team viewed in. And Ray could be, man, I can't figure this out. Call Trend Tech Support. We can also team view in. So we're all, you know, team viewed in. This guy's sitting there in, you know, Philadelphia with his tester. Ray's driving it. My tech support's driving it. And, you know, we'll figure it out. That's a great benefit. Yeah. It's, that's it's a great benefit. Yeah, Thanks it's, for the plug, Ray. Yeah. We, we got, uh, some, <laughs> as I said, there's a lot of, lot of really cool features in some of these tools. And if you don't know about them, you don't use them. And if Ray didn't know that, he could have been, well, crap, let me get in my car. I'll see you in three hours. Yep. Um, go to the city. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. But another really good thing is, again, now this is another tool. I've got, this is my NXG from NetAlly. Now, this thing is probably one of the most powerful devices I've ever used. It is not a certifier, though. But this is a full-on handheld computer that I can do every network test imaginable from the palm of my hand including Wi-Fi surveys now, which is really impressive for this device. That so, would be on the high end of a qualifier. That is a network analyzer, right? Correct. Uh, correct. Wired, wireless, you know, let me see all the device. I mean, that is a full blown network analyzer. Like you said, it can do some really cool stuff with wireless heat mapping and things like that. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. it does a lot of stuff, but again, Mike, to your point, I've had a lot of training on this net ally. And when I say a lot, I've had hours and hours and hours of training with uh, cable and connections. Mm -hmm. uh, and with NetAlly, trying to understand and learn how to use this thing. And, and quite frankly, there's still a ton that I don't know. I've barely scratched the surface because this does so much. It's it, But it, again, you've got to invest the time, effort, and energy that, as well as the money into these tools in order to be successful. The birth of that tool uh, was back in 1994 with a product called the Landmeter. Okay. And you know, between Fluke, NetScout, NetAlly, and some other things along the way, you know, I was with both of those companies at the time, so I know all about it. But you've got, you know, since 1994 to 2004, uh, four, four, 14, almost 30 years experience built into that thing. You're not going to pick it up and learn it, you know, in an hour, right? No, you're One not. Thing, yeah, so you got 30, in, 30 years of industry experience built into that. Give yourself some time to learn it. I, I am, and I'm I'm finding new reasons to use all of my tools as much as I can. I mean, it, it's it's important. Learn your tools and and learn what they're they're for, right? Don't go onto a job with a Phillips head screwdriver when all you need is a slotted screwdriver. Like, 
Yep. Don't use your clients as a hammer. Eggs. Well, it depends on which client we're talking about. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's no exception to the rule. <laughs> I'm kidding. Totally kidding. Yeah. Well, guys, listen. Um, I always like to, at the end of these podcasts now, give special shout outs. Now, one, Chuck, where can people find you? Fire up the old Google machine. Type in either one or two search terms, either Let's Talk Cabling or hashtag CBRCDD. I'll be the whole front page. Perfect. Uh, Mike, where can people find you if they want to talk to you? So our website, trend-networks.com. Contact us at trend-networks.com. We'll get to us. And of course, yeah, my name's too complicated. Contact us. It's a lot easier. We'll get there. (laughs) Get back to you. So uh, I like to give shout outs to people that do great work. So Chuck, is there anybody in the fiber game, in the copper game that you'd like to give a shout out to that people should look up? Oh, wow. Holy cow. There's so many of them. Um, Right on the spot, baby. That's how we do things. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, let me think here. Uh, I'll give you a minute, Chuck. I'm going to take the easy answer while you're thinking. Okay, go for it. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned cable and connections. Uh, uh, We support all vendors, all all, uh, distributors. I love cable and connections because they're going to come out. They understand the tools. You mentioned they, they are you know spending time to train you. Not all your distributors are going to do that, right? Those guys are rock solid. They understand the tools. They have a couple of resources there that I just think are pretty damn unique in this industry. The ability to understand, you know, 27 different, you know, manufacturers of different types of tools and test sets and whatever, and to be able to, you know, demonstrate and train on all. That's a pretty damn good skill set. So shout out to Dan Critch and the, and the people at Cable and Connections. Oh, I was trying to think of installers. I didn't realize we were talking about companies. <laughs> well, you can talk about whoever you want to talk about, Chuck. It's just, I, I, like I said, I took the easy road. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, did. yeah. If we're talking manufacturers, any one of the big manufacturers is going to be a good choice because there's only three places glass is manufactured in the United States. So all the fibers typically from one of them three plants. To me, it's oh, the, the newest thing that I'm excited about is this nanofiber. And that's not necessarily new, but it's newer. You know, they're putting some, you know, 6, 12, 24 strand cable in and some stainless steel armored fiber instead of the aluminum stuff. And it's extremely small, easy to use. Um, I'm waiting on my sample because I got my new podcast studio up on the hill. The electrician is supposed to wire it up next week. Uh, so I asked our nanofiber to give me some fiber to play with in the lab. So. I'm super excited to put my hands on that. But I'm also pretty excited about, you know, hollow core fiber and a bunch of other stuff that's just coming down the pipe. There's a lot of cool stuff coming. It's hard to pick one. Cool. No, it's all good. I mean, I, I want to give a shout out to a couple, since we're talking fiber at this point. Um, you know, Splicer Steve, as Stephen Clenner oh, does yeah. phenomenal work, man. There is there is nobody, in my opinion, more knowledgeable and more giving of his time than, than him. Um, Geeky Tech, I believe she's out of Texas or... New Mexico. I forget where exactly she is, but is that the lady who just had her baby? She did. She is. Yeah, she's Phoenix. Phoenix. Um, yeah. Her and her team, man, they do phenomenal work. Well, I'm trying. To, I've been trying to get her on the show for the last year. I've been. I've been just trying to get her to respond to some Instagrams. I hope she does because <laughs> I'd love to. I mean, she is incredible, man, and, and the business she's running is is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's another woman. Uh, Splicer keeps splicing. I'm not exactly sure where she is. My my estimate is she might be from Canada, but she does some ungodly incredible work, and she is very knowledgeable and very sharing with that and just fits completely into the community that we're trying to build. So, uh, you know, give them a look. Find them on Instagram and, you know, tell them TKW sent you. Um, but that's about it, guys. Um, last topic, and I will let everybody go because we've definitely hit that hour mark, and I know you guys want to get back to your, your day jobs. I personally don't, but I know you guys do. <laughs> um, Texgiving is coming up, and you guys both came down to Tech Fest. Texgiving is our giving event where we support a community in need, and we chose an organization in Baltimore called Mission Fit. I'd love to see you guys there if you can, if you can find yourself time in October to come up to the Baltimore area. Um, there's more information in our Slack community about that, but if you guys get time, man, we'd love to see you there. Because well, yeah, we, that's a definite chance, the possibility there for me because – I'm from Baltimore originally. I'm actually from Beltsville, which is just south of Baltimore, but my, my family still lives in the Baltimore area. So I can easily incorporate a visit home. The key question there is, will my training schedule allow between virtual classes and training? That's, that's, that's what's going to 
and that's not solidified in, for October yet. So no, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Just you know, just keep it in the back of your mind, Mike. How about you? You have my blanket commitment that Trend will support any of the community and charity events that uh, <laughs> that, that you guys do. Right? I I love those. They're a great cause. It feels great to be a part of it. Um, it feels great for our company to be a part of it. Um, me personally, I don't know if I will be there. I intend to be there, but like like Chuck, and if we got uh, you know, customer says, hey, we want to buy a hundred of those Lantec things um, in California. I want to be in California, but I guarantee you, somebody from Trend is will will be there. And so you, it's a it's a blanket statement. We we, no, we got I appreciate it. that. Yeah. No, and we, and we appreciate the the support that you know Trend has given the community, the Chuck that you've given our community. I mean, just having the ability to have the brains that you gentlemen have able to be at our fingertips at any time is is amazing and a, and a, and a true testament to who you guys are so thank you yeah, for um, sure. i just wish i could be more of a help to the community because like i said my problem is i i sometimes forget to check the the board the slack board and some other stuff like that and and i am i am busy busier than a one-legged man in a butt kicking contest so. it's okay you know it's but you know how to get a hold of me if you need to that's it and, and and if people are part of our community they are literally just a click away and with that Gentlemen, thank you for your time. I bid you adieu, and uh, let, let's keep the conversation going. And Chuck, if you're going to do a training session on certification, man, just let us know. We're in. I would love to, uh, yeah, spend some time with you on the trend tester and show you some of those really cool bells and whistles. Um, yeah. I mean, my goal is when you have multiple testers, after I'm done training, I want you to always reach for the blue one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's all I'll say. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. That was awesome. We'll see man. you guys. Thanks again. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. See you. Bye.